Well, hello there, watching the press preview. A first look at what is on the front pages as they come in. In the next half hour or so, we'll see what's making the headlines with the Observer's chief leader writer, Sonia Soda, and soon too, the Daily Mail's political editor, Jason Groves, just re-establishing our link with him. But hello to you in the meantime, Sonia. Great to see you. Uh, as ever, oh, so yeah. pre-budget, let's check out the front pages, shall we? The Metro then reporting that the Chancellor will keep the furlough scheme running until October to try to avoid job losses once lockdown is lifted. That's also the lead for The Guardian with the headline, Sunak extends the safety net. Daily Express says the Chancellor is set to put another £7 billion into the scheme. The eye points out that by the autumn, the furlough initiative will have been running for 18 months. The Telegraph suggests Rishi Sunak will focus heavily on bounce back funding as data shows the effects of the pandemic slowly receding. England football legend Sir Jeff Hurst speaks to The Sun to back Boris Johnson's offer to host all games in the European Championships this summer if they can go ahead. And the Daily Star has a story about a couple who just missed out on winning £182 million on the lottery. That's bad, isn't it? Uh, so, Sonia Sodra here, Jason Groves very soon as well. Um, well, there's no, no escaping the main story. And I have to say, Sonia, it's normally really exciting on pre-budget night because we get a big revelation about what's coming. What's left in that red box to tell us about? We know nearly everything, don't we? That's a good question, Anna, but uh, Rishi Sunak is quite a canny political performer, so I assume that there'll be one or two things that he's held back. But the big story on all of the front pages tomorrow is something that we were sort of expecting uh, the Chancellor to announce, which is that the furlough scheme will be extended for another three months um, and it will take us to the start of October. And I think that news will be a huge relief to people who have been furloughed these past four weeks uh, during our third national lockdown. It's going to be expensive, obviously, as you'd expect. It's quite a generous support scheme, so it's it's probably going to cost in the region of seven to ten billion pounds. But I think uh, the sort of relief that you're hearing from employers really highlights the fact that this is something that um, both employers and employees really felt was needed. And indeed, the sort of main attack line from Labour tonight is why didn't the Chancellor announce this a few weeks back just to give people that reassurance that they need needed that the support was going to be there. There are a few other tidbits in the mm -hmm. papers as well. Um, some of them we've sort of seen briefed in the last kind of two or three weeks. But one thing that I think is a bit disappointing is that the government is deciding to extend the extra £20 a week to universal credit at the start of the pandemic, but only for six months. Um, and I think this is a bit of a stingy move, considering when you look at what's happened over the last decade of austerity, you've seen some families with parents in low paid jobs lose thousands of pounds a year in tax credit. So that £20 extra a week was really, really needed at the start of the pandemic. It didn't make up for those big losses of the last decade. Lots of families were still worse off. And I think the idea that it's only going to be around for another six months when you've got an independent organisation like the Resolution Foundation saying that unemployment, we've, we've not seen the worst of it yet and it's to come. I do think that that's really worrying. Okay, well, let's bring in the Daily Mail's political editor, Jason Groves, who joins us for the first time. Uh, welcome to you. Great to see you on, uh, on Budget Eve. Uh, we were just saying that normally it's a really big deal, but oh, yeah. there's been so much revealed already uh, what is left. We know there's going to be money for sport, don't we? Theatres, museums and so on. We found out about that last night. Tonight we're finding out about furlough, uh, the extension of that, more grants too for the, for the self-employed. Um, but going back to furlough, which is the big headline in most of the papers, like the Metro, for example, as well. Um, will that be universally welcomed, do you think? Do you think some people think it's time to, uh, you know, for employers to, to, to bring people back to work effectively? No, I think it will be uh, broadly welcomed. I think there's a consensus around uh, the furlough scheme. What, what I think it will do, though, is set some alarm bells ringing. Um, the chance is going to go quite a bit further uh, than we were expecting. He's, uh, we'd, we'd been expecting it to run to the end of June when the roadmap runs out. Now saying it's going to September, and the, the Telegraph pick up on this uh, in their front page tonight, uh, suggesting that uh, it demonstrates that the government thinks actually people 
uh, and business are, are not going to be fully back to work until uh, potentially the end of September, uh, which slightly begs the question about what's going on in the meantime. You know, we've got this message coming from number 10 that uh, by June the 21st, it's going to be a big bang and we're going to be back to normal. The chance on the other hand seems to be suggesting, well, we could be well into autumn and, and who knows what might happen after that. And it's, it's worth reflecting as well, I think, that when the Chancellor launched this scheme uh, uh, back at the start of the first lockdown last March, it was due, it was due, to, uh, due to run until uh, the end of May last year. Uh, and as the eye uh, points out tonight, we're now looking at 18 months of furlough, uh, a scheme that was originally uh, due to last only uh, only for two or three. The yeah, eye then, budget 2021, 18 months of furlough. Um, who would have predicted that? Extraordinary. And in fact, it's worth remembering, I suppose, that when we looked at modelling um, on the night that uh, Boris Johnson unveiled the roadmap back on the 22nd of February, Sonia, a lot of the modelling did show cases rising again in the summer, which is why you had Jonathan Van Tam so specifically saying that the most important bit for him was to wait these five weeks between the elements of lockdown to see what this difficult variant, the B117, and actually does to cases. I think that's right. I think what you're seeing is the government being much more cautious this time, Boris Johnson being more cautious, far more than he was last summer, far more even than sort of October, November, when he was thinking about Christmas plans. And I think that reflects the fact that he's been burned by acting very incautiously. And that has been one of the things that's contributed to such a terrible second wave and the awful death rates, the numbers of people dying a day that we were seeing at the beginning of January. So I think it's very welcome that uh, Boris Johnson is treading more cautiously this time. As Jason sort of hinted, there is a, a group of MPs in the Conservative Party, you know, they dubbed themselves a COVID recovery group, who aren't particularly happy about this. So, and they would like the government to be moving faster. But I have to say that I think that I personally think the government's um, doing the right thing. You know, Boris Johnson, he has been burned before when he talks about sort of making himself a hostage to fortune and saying, this is going to be the last lockdown. We're never going to need to do this again. But I think there is very, very much um, a desire in number 10 to make sure that we, we don't have to move to the same sort of social restrictions that we saw in um, January again. Now, obviously, vaccines are going to massively help with that. But there are things, you know, on the scene like new variants, um, you know, that until we're all vaccinated, there may still be risk to the NHS. So I think that's why the government is taking this cautious approach. And as you hinted, Anna, one of the problems last summer was we just kind of relaxed everything at the same time. So it was very hard to know what was really responsible for that uptick in, fe in infections that we were seeing at the end of the summer that really kind of laid the base for this um, terrible kind of second wave that we saw in December, January uh, and January. So I think there is a desire to go more cautiously this time, step by step, obviously doing schools first because it's, it's school kids who are really suffering the most out of school, I think. Yes, not long to wait. We're all counting down the days. I certainly are. <laughs> I know everyone laughs, but it's true, isn't it? Um, but let's go to The Guardian now, because it's quite interesting there. Uh, you really show, thank goodness, that government borrowing is cheap right now, Jason, because there it is, piling money on top of money. Um, they say one year, 15 spending interventions, £280 billion spent. It, uh, it shows it quite clearly, doesn't it, Jason? It's absolutely extraordinary. And, uh, uh, you know, we were, if you cast your mind back a, a year, uh, Rishi Sunak was parachuted into uh, the Treasury at very short notice to his first budget. Uh, and at the time, he, uh, he brought forward £12.5 billion uh, of support for the economy. And uh, everyone at the time thought that that might be enough. Uh, now, he was back after only a few weeks. Uh, with it looking like a sort of pea shooter in this war against uh, COVID. It was nowhere near enough. And as The Guardian pointed out, he's in fact been about 14 times since. Uh, and who's to say that tomorrow will be the last one? I mean, I think, you know, we're expecting him to, uh, at the cost of this new support on furlough and on some of the other things that they're going to keep going, like business rates and the uh, VAT cut and so on, uh, they're going to cost somewhere between 30 and 50 billion pounds. So you can, that Guardian graph can go up a little bit further and I wouldn't like to bet on this being the last time uh, that the Chancellor has to come uh, to Parliament and announce more funding uh, for COVID. I wouldn't be at all surprised if we see 
uh, some additional help when the opening up starts. And uh, if things go wrong, and let's hope they don't, then he could he could be back sooner rather than later. So it's a, it's a very useful sort of graphic illustration that of just how far we've come. And of course, there's now a huge debate uh, within the Conservative Party for starters, but also within Labour. Uh, about how on earth will you pay this money back? And we've seen some of that erupt today. I mean, the Chancellor's ally, uh, William Haig, saying, uh, yes, it is time to start uh, putting up taxes, both on people and on businesses. Uh, slapped down earlier, really, by the business secretary, saying, um, I don't agree with that at all. Uh, the way out of this is to go for growth. And I think it's fair to say that there's already some tension in the cabinet about it. That hasn't burst out into the open yet. But Tory MPs, openly saying uh, that they weren't back tax prices. And Labour is split as well. Keir Starmer's not quite sure where to position himself. Uh, uh, he wants to look more pro-business and more responsible on the economy. Uh, but the Labour left is saying, well, hang on a minute. We're not going to sit there uh, and oppose uh, rising corporation tax on some of the fat cat companies we've been campaigning about for years. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? It felt like a, tur a turnaround for a while. Um, Jason, you do sound a little bit like a Dalek, so we might say goodbye to you for now and, and see you after the break with your own story, a front page of the Daily Mail, which is very interesting as well. So we will see you shortly and try and improve that. It was quite interesting, wasn't it? Um, Thank you. Uh, in the meantime, uh, that issue of, of tax, when to increase taxes, how to do it, is kind of fundamental to the years ahead, isn't it now, Sonia? That's absolutely right. And I think there's two questions facing uh, the Chancellor at the moment. It's at what point is it right to start trying and getting some of, you know, filling that black hole in the budget? At what point is it right to start raising taxes? And, you know, there's one school of economic thought, which is actually when the economy is doing badly, that's just not the time to, write, to increase taxes. You ride it out, you take on the debt, particularly when interest rates are very, very low and it's very cheap for the government to borrow. And then you can put taxes up later once the economy is doing better. So that thinking is by putting taxes up, you sort of get in the way of economic growth because you dampen consumer and business confidence further. And that's definitely a school of thought I ascribe to. But then there's this second question, which is when you're going to increase taxes, who's going to bear the brunt of it uh, and which taxes are you going to put up? I think what's so interesting is some of the briefing that we've seen about the tax rises that Rishi Sunak is considering. It's sort of the exact opposite of what George Osborne and Philip Hammond have done in the Treasury over the last 10 years. So, Sonia? you know, they slashed Sonia? corporation tax and they also cut income tax and Rishi Sunak is looking at, at, at putting them up. Sorry to, uh, to rush you. We've got lots to pack in in the second half, but uh, we will see you then. And Jason, hopefully, Dalek or no Dalek, uh, including his story, in fact, uh, could NHS staff be forced to take the COVID vaccine? That's what Jason's sources say, and he'll tell us more about that in just a moment. Well, welcome back. You're watching the press preview. Uh, let's go straight to the Daily Mail. And in the absence of Jason Groves to tell us about his exclusive, because we can't get him back because of technical issues now, um, you'll have to talk about it. This is NHS staff could be forced to have the jab, Sonia. They, um, Jason suggesting this is a radical plan considered for thousands who turn it down. This has been mooted, hasn't it? And it will be controversial. It is, and it's something that's been talked about in recent weeks. Um, you know unions in the NHS are sort of quite opposed to the plan because um, I think they would make the point that it's better to convince people proactively that they need to have the jab rather than making it a condition of employment. But it is concerning. So we know that I think it's one in five the weekend papers were reporting, one in five NHS staff haven't had the jab. In some care homes, it's, it's actually much higher than that. Um, and that's uh, particularly, I think, um, in some BAME communities communities. There's a lot of vaccine hesitancy. There's a lot of misinformation doing the rounds, um, for example, uh, around whether the vaccines are safe. Obviously, they, they are safe um, and they have been tested. So uh, it's a really tricky one because you really don't want members of staff putting themselves and other very vulnerable people who are coming into hospital, some of whom may not be able to have the vaccine for health reasons. You don't want them putting them at risk. But at the same time, 
you know, it's not great for staff morale to, to force people to have a vaccination. You really want them to be positively taking it up. So I'm, I'm not quite sure it's the way forward, but the yeah. fact that it's being considered shows how big concerns are. Yes, the Mail can reveal, the article says, that a review of vaccine passports will consider whether health staff who decline an injection could be legally obliged to have one. And the review will also look at whether compulsion should apply to care home staff, most of whom are not employed by the state. Employed by the state. So that will be interesting. Um, quick, I apologise for the time. Uh, 30 seconds on Nicola Sturgeon. Nine o'clock tomorrow morning, we hear her evidence. Yeah, it's Nicola Sturgeon's big day. So this is a story about Alex Ammons, her, her sort of mental uh, allegations of sexual misconduct um, against him. Two big questions for Sturgeon. When did she find out about them and did she mislead the Scottish Parliament? And then the Scottish Government investigation into Alex Ammons, it looks like there may have been problems with that. I think in normal times, if this goes badly for Sturgeon, it would have been a resigning matter. But she's so important to the independence campaign. I just can't see her, the SNP sort of um, uh, pushing her out. OK, Sonia, we will see you and Jason Groves, hopefully at 11.30. Thank you.